Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here along with Dr. Lina. Um, uh, and thank you for inviting Professor Soharzo. Uh, we had very good time uh, yesterday. We were very much taken care. We are, thank you for the hospitality you have given. Um, and uh, when I see all of you and all the residents here, uh, it reminds me of uh, our resident from Indonesia, uh, Dr. Henig Narula. Uh, she was uh, with us for three years and she finished uh, just last year and she came back to Indonesia. So she, uh, she's always cheerful and I remember her face when I see all these residents now. Uh, so uh, here we see so many residents. We, ha we don't have so many. We have around 20, 22 um, all the time. So, uh, so uh, I I'm going to talk about uh, the pattern of uveitis in Nepal. So uveitis uh, is a topic which, uh, which is uh, very interesting and it is it is uh, it varies from one part of the world pattern varies from one part of the world to another part of the world and from one race to another race so it is it is very uh, unique uh, because the uh, you know the prevalence of infection can one kind of infection can be uh, more in one part of the world whereas the other part of the world might not have that infectious organism and then it's about the race also, different kinds of genes, which uh, makes the difference. Uh, uh, th that's why the uh, pattern is different from one part of the world as to another part of the world. For example, if we talk about this birdshot retinopathy, this is predominantly the disease of white people because of the genetic cause. Whereas there are some other conditions like VKH, Vox-Koyanagi-Harda's disease, it is, uh, it is the disease of uh, the race. So more pigmented people have that disease, whereas less pigmented people don't have. So uh, in, in, if we talk about the world scenario, uh, VKH is very common in Nepal, in Japan. Of course, Japan is uh, the, uh, the country where they have the highest number. And in South America, they also have it, the his Hispanic people we call. And um, maybe it's common here also, I'm not aware of it. Um, so it's about race. And if we talk about infection, if we see this picture, this is diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis. It is caused by this worm. So this worm might not be present everywhere in the world. Uh, the reports are from different parts of the USA and different parts of uh, 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 other European countries. Uh, and. Uh, also from Asia. So this is caused by uh, this worm. You can see this. It's crawling underneath the retina. So th this, is, uh, th this can be various kinds of worm, um, starting from Toxocara catis, and uh, it could be raccoon worm. It could be the hook worm of dogs. So it can cause diffuse infection uh, in the retina and the optic nerve. And this is ocular histoplasmosis. So this is not present. Uh, Although this is caused by fungus, um, it, th this is uh, present in certain part of the world only. Like it's present in different parts of the United States and different parts of uh, the European countries. It's not found in this part of the world. So the, the, the thing is, so, uh, the, uh, it is so different. So some part of the world has some kind of infection and another part of the world has another kind of infection due to the prevalence of the infectious, uh, difference in the prevalence of the infectious organism. And some conditions are ubiquitous. It's found everywhere, like toxoplasma retinitis caused by toxoplasma gondii. It's almost present everywhere in the world. And herpetic uveitis, this herpes virus, is everywhere in the world. And if you talk about HLA-B27 uveitis, although um, uh, the prevalence study hasn't been done in many parts of the world about the, this gene, presence of gene in uh, the individuals, uh, what I feel is, uh, it's as pre prevalent as in the Western world. We recently did one study where we found uh, the high number of patients having HLA B27 gene. So it, this uveitis is also very common, which causes acute anti-uveitis, unilateral, hypopion, or without hypopion. 
And syphilitic uveitis, again, you know, this uh, syphilis um, troponema pallidum bacteria is everywhere. And uh, the, the incidence of syphilitic uveitis is rising because of uh, the world scenario where uh, the HIV infection is going up and then related infections are also uh, in the rising. Uh, so th th these, uh, these are found everywhere in the world, it's quite common. Now, uniqueness of uh, uveitis and about treating uveitis is uh, it's, uh, you know, it's only uh, one subspe subspecialty in ophthalmology where clinician in one part of the world is not comfortable treating the patients from another part of the world. Because uh, if you stay in one part of the world, you are used to seeing patients in that, uh, that area only, and then you, are, you uh, become aware of uh, you know, different kinds of patterns of disease which is prevalent there, and you are very comfortable treating them. You know how to treat. But then if you get patients from another part of the world, if you, or if you go to another part of the world and start treating different race and different uh, people, then you're not comfortable. That's why uh, we've seen uh, that uh, even uh, very good centers in the world, uh, UVI centers in the world, they, you know, they are not able to diagnose the condition when they have to treat the people from outside. So this is, uh, uh, for example, recently we had one case, uh, uh, Nepali living in uh, abroad. So he, he had post pan uveitis and he was being seen in Co South Korea and he was uh, made diagnosis of toxoplasmosis and he was being treated but then he was not getting better and then he went to the USA also. He was seen by a very renowned doctor over there. Even from there, the treatment was not making much difference in the symptoms and he was having blurring of vision in unilateral eye. And then when uh, he came to us, th then we started uh, treating him and then surprisingly he got better. His vision was almost 636 and then after treatment over time, he regained vision up to 66 partial. And then it turned out to be a case of toxocariasis. So this tells us that you know, it, the doctors are not uh, you know, inefficient, but then they are not aware of this toxocara in that part of the world. So they, don't, they are not able to make the diagnosis. And then another thing is uh, uveitis is basically clinical diagnosis. It's very difficult uh, to make a diagnosis based on the test. Although you know, now in the developed countries, there are so many uh, advanced tests available, it, even, after, even with those, you know, the clinical diagnosis, uh, the weight of clinical diagnosis is still high. So it's basically a clinical thing. And then another thing uh, commonly seen is if, uh, um, Asian, if an Asian person is living abroad in the Western country and if he or she develops uveitis and if the particular diagnosis is not being able to meet, then everyone thinks of tuberculosis. You know, it is a kind of prejudice thing or some, something else. They think that anything that happens in eye is caused by the TB bacteria. Okay? So the, this also we have seen a lot. Patients have months and months of infection, uh, inflammation in the eye and then they don't get better and then they come to us and then we finally find out that they are being treated as UV, uh, the tub tubercular uveitis. Then we, uh, when we look at the papers and we, when we look at the eye, then we find that there was no symptoms or signs really uh, con con you know, consistent with the tubercular uveitis. So this is another problem you know, many of the doctors are facing in the, in different, uh, the developed part of the world because they are not aware what it looks like, you know, tubercular uh, uveitis. That's why they don't know how to treat. Um, and if we talk about this part of the world, then we are not familiar with autoimmune disorders. We have very less ex experience. If we get birdshot chorioteinopathy, then we would not be able to recognize because we, because we haven't seen much. Uh, although, no, although, and uh, we, uh, you know, we uh, sometimes get uh, foreigners uh, traveling and then they come to us with uveitis when they are traveling and then we have a little bit difficulty in diagnosing. And then, as we, I have already said, uh, diagnosis is basically clinical. And although the uveitis causes, uh, you know, uh, is responsible for 3 to 7% of 
the blindness in total, um, which is uh, you know reported in various papers, uh, we feel that is three to seven percent. This is not a big big deal. But then we have to remember that if it is cataract or if it is um, you know age-related macular degeneration, which hits the list uh, at the top, they uh, these diseases occur in the old age or you know aging people so they live blind for lesser year but if you talk talk about uveitis uveitis affects the young and the uh, adult people rather than children and uh, you know old age people so if they become blind they will live blind for a longer longer years so that that gives Law, more impact on the society. So, although it affects smaller population, it affects young adults. And the chronicity, the recurrence, and the complications, they cause the less productivity in their life. And it will have very bad impact on, on the so, uh, personality. And this will lead to psychosocial impact. The social impact uh, is very high with uveitis, although small appear number of people are affected so we have to be very uh, you know um, aware of this thing and uh, you know because of the fact that it contributes less on the blindness if you uh, ask for grant um, for some uveitis study usually grants are rejected because they said that this is not public health issue so this uh, we feel a little bit bad that you know People are interested in public health issues only like diabetic retinopathy, ARMD. If you ask grant for these uh, researches, then you are immediately given grant. So this is, uh, uh, we have to make uh, people aware that, uh, you know, the, the blindness occurs in younger generation, younger people, not in old age. So we can see this. 70, so the age group 70 to 60 years, which is the most active working group of our society, is 80 percent. Whereas children, 8 percent, and above 61 years, it's 12 percent only. Now we can see how important UVITIS, UVT blindness is. And uh, if we break down, we see that the age group 20 to 29 are affected the most, almost one quarter, like 24 percent of all the, you know, UVAD patients uh, lie in this group, which is the most active group. Uh, if we talk about sex ratio, uh, we find that uh, in a study which we did, male-female ratio is quite uh, normal, I mean uh, equal, sorry. But if we just, uh, do, you know, if we divide into different types of uveitis, then surprisingly, post uveitis uh, is uh, more common in male, almost 61 uh, percent. So males are uh, prone to develop post uveitis. In terms of laterality and duration, uh, we are happy to see that the limited, uh, limited disease is more than persistent, which is good. So it's uh, like uh, two-thirds is limited and uh, one-third is pers persistent. In terms of unilaterally, uh, unilateral, uh, laterality, again, it's good that more people have unilateral disease. At least, you know, if they become blind, maybe only one eye will become blind, not two, if, even with good treatment, best treatment. And uh, ocular systemic causes, if we, um, if, if we try to find out, it's uh, ocular is 31 uh, percent, systemic is 12 percent, and still idiopathic is high. You know, we are not able to make diagnosis in a little bit more than 50 percent of cases. So it's very difficult to make diagnosis in uveitis. And infectious and non-infectious, uh, infection is still, you know, a bit more than non-infectious condition. Again, idiopathic, we know it's high. And anatomical uh, uveitis, uh, uh, out of that, enter uveitis is very common. It, it, is, uh, it is, you know, the same in all parts of the world, I think. Enter uveitis is more than, a little bit more than 50%, and rest is intermediate uveitis, 
and post-uveitis and pan-uveitis. So, in terms of uh, uveitis in Nepal, anterior is the most common and uh, pan comes at the second, third is intermediate uveitis and then post-uveitis. In, ter in terms of infectious uveitis, leprosy is still there in Nepal, syphilis is also present and there are few percents of post streptococcal infection. So, this is a picture of a patient suffering from leprosy and these are the rashes of syphilis. Okay. In terms of infectious ocular disease only, we talked about the infectious systemic disease. Now, it is infectious ocular disease, herpetic disease is more common and then comes toxoplasmosis then tuberculosis and then Sharpu. We'll, I'll talk about Sharpu in a while. So, this is a very typical toxoplasma retinitis. We all know, although the picture quality is not very good. This is tuberculoma, big tubercle, uh, big choroidal uh, lesion from tuberculosis. And this is, of course, herpetic uh, uveitis, which has caused, uh, it's not very visible here in a iris atrophy. In, term, in terms of non-infectious uh, systemic condition, HLA B27 disease is uh, the most common and then VKH is another common condition. So, the hypopion and uveitis with HLA B27 and this is the bamboo spine which we see in the late stage of HLA B27 and closing spondylitis. And this is the swollen disc and then serous detachment of retina, bilateral condition in VKH where we get a lot of systemic uh, findings like you know, skin changes, poliosis, madrosis, and then you can see the vitiligo patches. And in the late, uh, late, uh, late present, uh, pre presenters, we find sunset glow fundus. So, this is uh, the slide showing non-infectious systemic condition. The commonest one is sarcoidosis, where we get a lot of skin findings and some patients can have you know, pulmonary symptoms and pulmonary symptoms might, be, might not be present even in the late uh, condition of the pulmonary disease and they will have uh, you know, pan-uveitis, some might have just anti-uveitis. So, this is This is vasculitis in sarcoidosis known as candle wax stripping. And Bishets, not, although not very common, are found in Nepal also. And they cause, you know, severe vasculitis and optic neuropathy. And they have this uh, oral ulcer. And sarcoidosis, I should say that it's, uh, it's uh, usually underdiagnosed. And they all, it is always confused with tuberculosis because they have very common features. This is, uh, that is, you know, granulomatous KPs uh, and then it could be pan-uveitis. They both can have retinitis, choroiditis. So, it's always, uh, you know, underdiagnosed. So, for uh, making the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, again, you know, the history is very important. Although there are some diagnostic tests which might help us. Uh, towards diagnosis of sarcoidosis, like you can uh, have uh, you know, ACE level, angiotensin converting enzyme level. You can check, uh, check the MANTU test, that is your uh, skin test, and usually it's negative if it is sarcoidosis. And then clinically, you can uh, you should try to find out the skin conditions because there are skin certain skin lesions which are very typical for sarcoidosis. So it's again you know clinical diagnosis. So, it is quite common. A non-infectious ocular condition, that means it's not associated with any other, you know, systemic condition in the body. That's Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis. It's quite common. Another one is serpiginous chorotinopathy. So, the top picture, uh, it's not really visible. There are small stellate KPs present in this slide. 
uh, which uh, is uh, found in Fuchs heterochromic iridocytes, iridocyclitis. And the bottom picture is of serpiginous choroidopathy. There are, you know, choroidopathy changes here and here. And if we talk about this serpiginous choroidopathy, although it is uh, one of the conditions uh, listed in white dot syndrome, which is basically non-infectious -infec condition, what we see is in uh, Nepal and you know neighboring countries, it, it has some association with with tuberculosis. When we see serpiginous choroidopathy, we always try to find you know uh, try to see whether could it whether it has some connection with tuberculosis. And many a times we find that uh, if you don't treat with tubercular anti-tubercular medication, they keep recurring. They might become bilateral. So uh, if the Mantu test is positive, if it is bilateral, if it is recurrent, then we always think of treating with ATT. And uh, surprisingly, we find a uh, very good result. After treating with ATT, they do not recur. So the, it has some connection with infection also somehow. And another condition is Postnus-Loschmann syndrome, where the intraocular pressure goes acutely high with very minimally inflamed eye and sympathetic ophthalmia which occurs after penetrating trauma or uh, intraocular surgery is also present and lens induced that is you know hypermature cataract can um, lead to uveitis if it is not treated on time it's still there in uh, Nepal although we've been fighting for cataract blindness and we have uh, been able to succeed a lot but still um, you know, small percentage of patients are still, you know, not getting the treatment on time because uh, because of the you know, lack of healthcare facility, and so they develop uh, uveitis due to the um, hypermature cataract. We know that post uveitis can be divided into retinitis, choroiditis, chororetinitis, and retinal vasculitis, uh, neuroretinitis. So in terms of post uveitis toxoplasma plasmosis is the most common one. I think it, it is uh, true in various other parts of the world uh, as well. And uh, tubercular uveitis is, might be different in other parts of the world, but in Nepal it's still prevalent. Toxocariasis, which I was talking about in the beginning, is also seen. Cystisarcosis again is also quite common. You can see this. Lesions, very typical of toxocara um, choroiditis. And this is, of course, cystisarcosis. And uh, in case of uh, post uveitis, we are able to find out the cause more frequently than other part of the uveitis. A little less than half, you know, half uh, of the cases uh, are idiopathic, whereas more is, uh, in more of the cases, we, we know the diagnosis. In terms of pan uveitis, again we will be talking about uh, you know shapu, which is very common and unique to Nepal. Toxoplasmosis, of course, BKH, and focal herpetic retinitis. This is not a very common condition recognized everywhere in the world. But uh, if uh, if uh, you know if I uh, when I searched the world literature, we, we, I found very few reports. We know about acute retinal necrosis, which is very common everywhere. I mean, not common, but it's found everywhere in the world. But it is this focal herpetic retinitis is a bit different. There'd, there'd be only one single, you know, retinitis patch, and uh, it is usually in the posterior in or very close to the mid periphery of the retina, and it is associated with uh, pan uveitis or just posterior uveitis, and this is caused by herpes virus. So this is less common, but you know it is found in Nepal. And now, if if we talk about Shapu, it is seasonal hyperacute pan uveitis. The abbreviated it is abbreviated as Shapu, uh, and it it is uh, so far reported only uh, from Nepal. It affects children basically. About around seventy five percent of uh, the patients are children, and only twenty five percent are adults. And what happens is it's, it comes in a form of outbreak. And they come with unilateral acute onset of 
pain, redness, photophobia, and usually uh, children are not able to say that uh, they have less vision in that eye and it is uh, taken as conjunctivitis in many cases and they, uh, by the time the diagnosis is made it is already late because within two or three days I become blinds from, blind from severe infection, inf inflammation and they present, most of them present with hypopion. The feature is very much consistent with you know endophthalmitis, any kind of endo endophthalmitis and then uh, in the uh, past uh, nobody knew how to treat it. it it was treated with various agents like uh, immunosuppressives steroid and everything but uh, you know it did not give good result and later on what we found out that when we give intravitreal injection of antibiotic they recover dramatically if they come on time that is within 24 to 48 hours you know they recover completely they have uh, you know, they regain 6 6 vision even if they had presented with hand mov movement or count finger vision. So, this is a, a, a mystery uh, yet because we, are, we haven't been able to, you know, reach, the reach to the conclusion what actually causes. But we have done various studies which have shown very much a positive relationship with this moth. You can see this moth, this is called Gazelina moth. Uh, we have done one epidemiological study which uh, shows uh, that uh, you know the children who are uh, who had come into contact with this moth have developed this condition and um, not in all cases but 10 percent of cases we have found the the follicles hair follicles of those moths in different layers of cornea and even in the antechamber and the antivitreous phase but it's only 10 percent and many, you know, almost 50 percent of patients, more than 50 percent of guardians say that they had been playing with this moth because, you know, children are always attracted to insects uh, and these are so pretty and they like, uh, you know, touching them and some naughty uh, children will, you know, kill the, you know, the moth with their hands or broom and then they will rub their eyes and then uh, the next day or so they develop this severe inflammation. And, uh, um, in one of our studies, which is still not published, we found streptococcus pneumoniae very commonly inside the vitreous. It's almost like um, all total the bacterial growth was nearly 40 percent, uh, 40 percent, and the predominance was of streptococcus pneumoniae, and rest was uh, Staph aureus. If it is adult, then Staph aureus is grown more frequently. If it is children, then streptococcus pneumoniae. So we we still don't know how the moth and this bacteria is connected. There might be some connection which we still have to find out. But then it is basically you no know, streptococcus pneumonia, uh, endophthalmitis. And we all know that whenever streptococcus gets inside the eye, the outcome is always very, very poor. No matter uh, whether it's uh, in you know uh, from uh, postoperative view endophthalmitis or traumatic endophthalmitis, whenever we have a streptococcus uh, growing in the, uh, you know, from the vitreous, we know that the outcome is very, very poor. So it's not surprising that the Shahpur children, when they come late, late means, uh, you know, three days later, then there's no chance of, you know, saving the eye. They become thysical. So this is very unique in Nepal. And intermediate uveitis, it's a bit uh, depressing because, you know, idiopathic is almost 95 percent. We are not able to find out the cause. And uh, out of known causes, pars planitis is um, common. Again, you know, pars planitis means it's a diagnosis of exclusion. When we don't find anything, we call it pars planitis. So if it is bilateral snowball, snow banking in a um, young middle-aged people, a patient, then it's pars planitis. And sarcoidosis can also cause intermediate uveitis. In terms of anti-uveitis, herpetic, herpetic uveitis is more common. And, and the second is HLA-B27 disease. And pediatric uveitis, we just talked about Shapu, it's the most common one. And toxoplasmosis is the second one. You can see in one of our outbreaks a season, we had many, you know, many children at the same time Sometimes six children would come um, on the same day with uh, acute onset of pain, redness. And these were three children who were being treated at the same time. They all had unilateral red eyes. 
and they will have hypopion uh, uveitis with a lot of fibrin and uh, if they come a bit late then this fibrin will cover the whole pupil you won't be able to see the fundus at all and uh, some children develop tricycle eye because of that and uh, this uh, this uh, is uh, you know taken from one of our mm, uh, uh, publication which was in uh, 2017 thank you i learned this term terima kasih from zena yesterday <laughs> thank you so much